Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity of talking to you today. I thought I should bring a prop along um, because I think we're just going to talk about cars, aren't we? <laughs> no, I actually find that in the toilet, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can use it. We're not going to talk about cars. All right, just to see where we are. This is a slide that most of you know. It's a slide that comes from Jeb uh, Brugman, and it basically talks about how many people are going to live in cities. And basically, the number of people who are going to live in cities is increasing rapidly. But the thing that is actually exciting about this for me is if you look at the factors that sit behind that, not only the population of the cities, the fact that most of the greenhouse gases are coming out of cities and they're driving our economies, if we get cities right, we can actually solve a lot of the problem. So I want to talk to you a little about that today. Our city of Melbourne is facing that uh, challenge at the moment. We sit at 4.25 million. The latest uh, uh, demographic survey was done and we projected to get to 10 million by 2050. We're going to have to build twice the capacity, more than twice the capacity in the next 33 years that we built in 200. So, there's the challenge. And basically, one of the solutions, obviously, is the best contraceptive in the world is cities. And so if we can actually get cities right, we've got a half a chance of controlling the population growth on this planet. And, and that has to be one of the prerogatives. Transistor radios aren't going to work. Melbourne has gone through a, a process of transformation over the last 33 years, and I think some of the lessons that we've learnt on the way are applicable to how we might think about dealing with the future and this rapid uh, growth of our population and climate change. We had a strategy back in 1985. Uh, the city had no money. It was going out the back door generally. And the city was, uh, the vision was a very simple one. And I think sometimes I re read vision statements and they're very difficult to understand what you're actually going to do. And what we were asked to do was make it a 24 hour city and make it look and feel like Melbourne. And that was quite a challenge, but it was actually a very simple vision that we could follow and, and come to grips with. We didn't have this framework when we started, but I use this framework because it actually works quite well with this. And if you want to actually look at behind this, um, you can uh, look, Google the value of good urban design New Zealand. And, and the gentleman who put those, that together, and it was unfortunately just gentlemen, um, basically have a lot of data that sits behind why these eight things are so important. So I'm going to use that as a bit of a framework to talk about what changed in Melbourne. First of all, around density, we didn't have a residential population in the centre of the city. And so one of the biggest challenges is how do we bring people back to live in the city? And we started a program that was called Postcode 3000. And we set a target in the 85 strategy plan. I can remember sitting in a room on a Friday afternoon and they were saying, so how many people do we need to bring back to the city? And there was no science about that. There was a feeling that if we got 8,000 people in 15 years, we would have made a difference. So we put 8,000 people in 15 years, and that's about as much science as was behind that. But I think the important thing was setting a target, because then we had to go and achieve that target. And we tried adding bonuses on if you gave uh, residential in the planning scheme. None of that worked. What worked is the property market collapsed at the end of the 1980s. <coughs> And everybody had overbuilt commercial buildings, and it was a bit of a global phenomenon. And some of those buildings, the second grade office buildings, were vacated. And then the penny dropped. We can convert these buildings into residential. And we started the program, as we say, called Postcode 3000. To me, this type of transformation sits at what our city is going to need to do in the future. We can't build that stuff in the time that's available. So we're going to actually have to use the stuff we've already got far more efficiently. And this is an example, as you can see there, converting uh, an office building to residential. This gives you some idea of those people that were actually living in the city back in 1982. 
that's what exists today. Every one of those dots is five residential units. The city is to totally transformed because this population has come to Melbourne and with it has come, you know, business and a whole lot of activity. It was a project that was set up and we designed very little. We had a couple of pilot studies that we could actually take people to and show them what it meant. But after that, we got lucky and Macquarie Bank took an old building and asked us the question, so what's your program about? And we actually led them through the program and they did uh, plans off, uh, uh, sorry, designs off the plan and sold them within three months, 35 units. And once Macquarie Bank was doing it, the floodgates opened. NAB, the National Australian Bank, said they wouldn't invest in city, city, central city residential because it wouldn't catch on. One of the things that I suppose intrigues us at the moment is density, and this was something I saw in the Venice Biennale when Ricky Burdett put that show on some years ago. And something that you all know, but a bit of a surprise to me, that Barcelona is one of the densest cities in, uh, in the world. That's Barcelona at the back with the lady uh, by the red door. The Melbourne, Sydney cities are right down at the bottom of that agenda. And part of what we need to do in Melbourne is increase that density. And I've always been fascinated by the models I see in Barcelona, Copenhagen, Berlin, the courtyard developments. And, and what's sat behind those, more importantly? Because one of the things we're battling with are planning schemes that have actually been inherited almost from the 1950s. And planners drag them along and keep them in pretty much the same format. Yet Seda went out and actually said, how wide do the streets need to be? How big do the blocks need to be so you can have an internal courtyard? And maybe if you build it to seven storeys, you'll get a reasonable density. And now we see Barcelona changing in front of us. We're actually closing off some of those streets now and creating open spaces. So understanding density is important. Um, mixed use, mixed use is uh, the next most important one and really because if we're going to get more out of the infrastructure, having a mixture of uses, and again I, I think I'm possibly preaching to the converted, is important uh, to get that efficiency. Melbourne has built 48% rebuilt, 48% of its downtown in the last uh, 30 years. It's a huge uh, development that's taken place, and it has transformed the downtown, and not all of it is good. I'd like to stand here, and despite what The Economist says, it says about us being the most livable city, you've got to question the criteria. Some of the stuff that we started with was quite good. Um, you can see conversions here of heritage buildings that have had additions to the top. Buildings like Melbourne Terrace by Nanda Katsalides, which is uh, a seven-story seven building, um, and still holds its value today. Apartments there are, are very hard uh, and, and well sought after each time they come on the market. What came with that uh, boom in uh, residential were increases in businesses, and food and beverage is an example. Back in 82, we had the 604 establishments. By 2002, that's 1,000, and by 2012, that's nearly 2,000. That business, has not only kept the city alive at night, but it's also provided an income and a stimulation for the city. Retail was one of the things we noticed in the 1980s that would have been an indicator of whether we were succeeding. What our city was doing is what many of the American cities are doing, taking the energy out of the center of the city and putting in the shopping, shopping malls uh, in suburbia. And retail was su uh, suffering. So we set ourselves the aim of saying, we, if we can win back retail, if we can compete with the Chadstons of the world, um, then we will actually uh, be succeeding. So there, that's where we were in 1982. By 1992, we were still going down, uh, and then it started to turn around, and we brought retail back. To the extent that Gandal, who is a, a very rich man in uh, Melbourne and owns the shopping centres, Jokingly said to the Lord Mayor the other day, I shouldn't talk to you, you're stealing my business away from me. And that's what's actually happening. The retail has come back down, uh, downtown and is supported not only by you know, the major stores, but the small lanes and arcades and the bespoke retail. As I said, not all that we did was good. And uh, we've had a couple of ministers. Uh, the state has the responsibility for planning, not the city. 
And uh, a couple of our ministers have actually favored developers possibly more than they should and started to lose the understanding of the street as being the most important environment. So here we have an example of car parking going up to about six stories and buildings coming straight off the street. What happened in some of those areas, that's in South Bank, is you can see South Bank here at the bottom of this picture. The number of uses actually in that area was quite small compared with the central city. And if you go off uh, to, uh, you know, what would be your left of the slide over here, that's our Docklands. And Docklands, again, has been simplified. We get a lot of residential and a lot of big business uh, and, and large uh, sites. We haven't got that intensity of uh, mixed use. And that's particularly marked when you add in the, the, the secondary uses as well. So one of the challenges is how do we actually build new urbanism and get that mixed use in? The next one is, uh, I think, what a lot of people think uh, urban design is about, and I seem to feel as though I've spent the last 40 years of my life um, talking about uh, the public realm. And in Melbourne, uh, we have uh, a city, uh, and this is our responsibility is really for this inner city, and part of those spaces, that public realm, are the green spaces, and we're well endowed with green space in the central city. We have an, a river that runs through, and we have dock lands, but the major public space, 80% of the public space, are our streets. So the one-liner that um, sort of resonates in my head is if you design a good street, you design a good city. And how difficult could that be? Every one of us walks down, and everybody who's in a city walks down or through a city, and in a nanosecond they analyze a good or a bad street. They'll look down and they'll just analyze, they'll pass a bad street, they'll go into a good street. So what is so difficult that we just can't do this? How many new developments have we walked around and the streets are dead and we have black walls and, and we just don't understand this basic concept? Why can't we get that right? Because if we got that right, we'd have much better cities. So we started looking at the different patterns in our cities, the waterways, the built form, the street pattern, public transport, and said, if we can slowly reinforce each of those, uh, quali uh, those patterns over time, and we superimpose values on those, things like a clear structure, easy to read, um, sustainability, continuity and change, how much of the old do you want to keep and how much of the new do you want to keep? So we went through a process of trying to work out a very simple way of just building and reinforcing those patterns. Simple things like saying, when we pave our streets, they'll always be in bluestone. And here in, in, in Denmark, you know, I get a great deal of joy. No matter which city I go to, the paving's exactly the same. And, and there's a logic to it. You can see it. You know how it works. You know, and, and when it comes to maintenance, they've worked it out. Berlin's the same. So for us, this was a new thing. People think of Melbourne as a bluestone city, but in fact, that was the only bluestone that was in Melbourne back in 1985, and we said, it's all going to be bluestone, and now we've got to this extent where almost the whole of the CBD is paved in bluestone. Why is that important? It's a good work walking surface. It's easy to walk on, it doesn't show the chewing gum. If someone digs it up and the agencies tend to dig it up, you can replace it and nobody will know you've even been there. On top of that, you can place things like cafes and signage and public art, and that's what we've done. We've gone around and, and overlaid on this order of the paving the interest that comes from things like public art, etc. We've also designed our own suite of furniture. We could have gone to JC Deco, but we decided JC Deco actually builds for everybody else. Why don't we just have a Melbourne's furniture? Why don't we design a suite of furniture from advertising bollards to where they sell the newspapers and uh, city tours, to micro uh, cells that uh, the uh, telephone agencies want to put in and they paid for these uh, bollards that gave information to the public, to toilets, the toilets in New Zealand toilet, the next do that we just actually clad uh, in our livery. We also designed all our seats. So we've got a range of seats, um, different seats for parks as, as for urban areas. Everything was designed to last for 50 to 60 years. That was the criteria. 
And I often got accused of, you know, designing BMW furniture. And I resisted the temptation of saying, you know, we'll just make it cheaper. We actually do spend a lot of money on our furniture, but it does last. And there are rubbish bins that have been there now for 30 years. And we're just having a little argument at the moment with the engineers because the engineers found a, a rubbish bin in China that will actually compact. But we're going to have to throw away 800 rubbish bins to get these compactors in. And we've designed a compactor where we can just take the lid off our rubbish bin and it's got its own compactor in. So there's a little bit of a turf war going on in Melbourne at the moment. And then we planted trees. The simple, easiest way of changing a city was to plant trees. And if you live in a hot country like uh, Australia, the amazing effect the trees have on cooling that environment. So these are some of the trees that we planted since 1993 in the central city. And I'll come back to that because we've got a real problem with climate change. And one of the big strategies we're now putting in place is the urban forest strategy. Our secret weapon, of course, was coffee. If you come to Melbourne, I can highly recommend the coffee. It is good. We've got a great heritage of Italians who have actually brought the coffee with them. And what we did was say, if we had to start improving the streets, then we want people to stay on the streets. We want people to sit on the streets. <coughs> and so overlaid on our streets are things like flower sellers, cafes, fruit sellers, and our livery of furniture that gives some idea of, of what our streets are like. And what we've been able to do is go from two little sidewalk cafes up there back in 1985 to something like 534 today. It's on a principle of not, it's not an, a money uh, earning exercise. We don't charge a big rental. Uh, in fact, we charge a very low rental, but we say this quality and, this, uh, you know, and, and the standard needs to be of a high standard and we regulate that. And uh, if you don't maintain it, if you leave rubbish lying around, you lose the, the privilege of actually being, having a sidewalk cafe. Both McDonald's, Subway, and uh, one other tried it on, and we took away the sidewalk cafe. And nobody else has actually sort of been French since then. This little slide, in a way, summarizes much of what we do. Um, on the bottom slide here, you've got uh, our town hall, and we cut what used to be a, a door into, uh, sorry, a window into a door and externalized our building. Bluestone paving, the flower cellar, this was when we were closing Swanson Street, our main street, and I'll come to that. We put there as a passive policeman. They have to trade until 10.30 10 at night, and they got a very low rental. In fact, they paid almost no rental at all. And we took a little public space adjacent to that, and we designed this little cafe and worked with Akia Makagawa, who was a sculptor, to uh, produce this uh, sculptor, sculpture. Those small interventions are what we've been doing around our city. We've taken a traffic island, and turned it into a celebration of our Chinese community and a place where people can sit. We've taken an award-winning city square that never worked and actually redeveloped it by saying squares only work because of the activity that happens around them. As designers, we try to put stuff, oopsie, we try to put stuff into the squares. Some of the best squares have nothing in them, but it's the activity around the edge that drives it. So we sold off down to the water wall that you can see. We reinvested that money, um, there is a pointer here, I think, no, don't worry, uh, reinvested that money in the theatre over there, the Regent Theatre that had been dark for 25 years, and we sold, uh, with, uh, we sold the site to a hotel group, and our requirement was that they act, had active frontages back onto the, the city square, and we designed a cafe where the slide's being taken from it opened up. So at least we had activity on two sides of the square. And since then, it's worked as a meeting place uh, for, for the people of Melbourne. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's a big hole because we're putting a metro down. The green spaces of Melbourne, we were blessed by the, uh, the early um, planners of our city with this ring uh, of, of parks that surround our city. And we have a great park, park network that runs uh, down the eastern side of the CBD. The plan was, as part of that uh, improving the public realm, what if we could link that park up? What if we could take that park that actually runs from down here all the way to the bay and, and make it seem like one park? 
It was divided by railway lines, uh, the gas and fuel buildings uh, up by where the river curves there were in front of the cathedral. So we did some aspirational thinking and said, well, this is what we've got. Wouldn't it be nice to actually have something that actually joined those up? And again, having that as an ambition, when the opportunity presented itself and Federation Square was a partnership we did with the state government, we got to convince the Premier of the day to remove uh, 26 railway lines that were only used for storage of trains, not running lines, and design and, and build an eight hectare park that started to link the city back up. So we've been slowly adding to the public space. Melbourne was not designed as a city with public space. It was designed as a commercial city. Um, in fact, there were no public spaces. There were four markets, and they were the best we got as public spaces. So we've had to come back in and, and recreate the, the urban spaces of, of the city. And that's what we've been doing for the last 35 years, is just adding to uh, the public space. Local character, I think, is a simple thing, and most of us understand it. Why try and copy someone else's city when you've got a city that's distinctive yourself? The distinction in our city is that um, because it was a commercial city, it had very big blocks. Um, they were 200 metres by 200 metres. Fortunately, the surveyor put a 10-metre street through them. They got subdivided uh, in the 19th century, uh, really, to make more money. And in the subdivision, you've got these lanes and arcades that ran through. And then in the 20th century, they started to actually consolidate that. They started to knock down the buildings and actually build big buildings. And what you got was this slide in the middle is by I am Pay. Um, you know, big architects actually transferring ideas from somewhere else that had no relevance to our city whatsoever. You do that 20 times in your city, you kill the streets. So we just said, that's not going to happen anymore. If you build in our city, you've got to externalize. You've got to actually build back onto the street. And the slide at the bottom uh, is the same slide uh, where they've started to break ho open holes. You can make money out of holes in the wall. You can't out of concrete walls. We, we blessed with uh, this network of lanes, and, and we've reinvigorated them. We've allowed people to trade out onto them. They've become a bit of a calling card for Melbourne uh, as part of our laneway uh, strategy. Connectivity, I think we all again understand. How do people move around your city? What is the priority? And we started, and my little joke with the car was we started back in 1985, basically by saying we're going we're gonna to slowly move the car out of the city. We couldn't say that openly, but we started a policy of doing that. And the policy uh, started with removing bits of asphalt, and I'll come back to that, but really took an impetus in 1992 when we closed the main street through the, uh, the city uh, to cars and, and left it for public transport, bicycles and pedestrians. There are some service <coughs> deliveries that come in during hours. And we took a street that was failing, as you can see on the one side there, and widened the footpaths by three and a half meters and planted a hundred trees and dramatically changed the pedestrian numbers in that street. So from 12, uh, close to 13,000 back in 1992, we have 47,000. And I'm not sure that that figure's right, because when I look at the footpaths in Swanson Street, they are absolutely bursting. And this is no special occasion. This is what happens at lunchtime, in the evening, etc. We improved access to the public transport, and I was delighted to see in Berlin the bikes between the tram, and, and the footpath, because I got absolutely castigated for doing that. But it does actually teach respect between the cycling and, and pedestrian uh, things. And it is the road rule in Melbourne. You stop behind a tram, so the bikes do that. And we changed the furniture and, and made it uh, comfortable for people to get on the trams and use them. We also recognised that Melbourne used to be a, bike, uh, a cycling city. And uh, if you look at this si slide, um, you know, the number of cycles outweighed uh, the cars quite considerably. So, belatedly, uh, following Copenhagen, and we've been lucky enough to have a long association with uh, the Gell office, and uh, we, we've started to actually build a network of bike, uh, bike paths through our city. We've got a long way to go, but we are building infrastructure. This is a bridge that connected uh, over a railway line. We've actually made the space, but now we've got to start moving the space and protecting the bikes uh, by putting them on the inside, not the outside. 
But we are getting to the stage where there are a large number of people cycling to work. In fact, the numbers have gone up from 1% in 2002 to 17% of commuters into the city, central city today. Uh, still, the network uh, is not as good as it could be. And if we could actually improve it on, on the basis of Copenhagen and other cities, um, a lot of the people who are not cycling at the moment are the, the young people, the very young kids, and, and uh, a lot of the females in the city find it quite confronting to have your car on the inside and you're on the outside. The biggest accident in Melbourne is the door ring. Someone opens the door and takes you out. Public participation, you could not do this without having a community uh, that uh, w would come along with you. And we tried the town hall meeting, and I'm sure you've all been to those. And if I never go to another town hall meeting in my life, it will never be too soon. I got tired of meeting the same 20 people, talking to them with their own agenda. So we've tried to widen it out. We've tried to actually find ways of, of putting it out. And one of our successful ones was um, <clears throat> the turn of the century, Melbourne was hit with what some people refer to as the millennium drought, uh, the onset of climate change, uh, where we had 11 years of uh, very low rainfall and sometimes no rainfall at all. We got to the stage where 48% of the trees were going to die in 20 years. At that stage, I had within my division responsibility for the parks and gardens. And this was quite an emotional thing for me, to actually see trees that are 150 years old just dying. So we said, no, we're going, to, we're going to try and do something about that. There were reasons they were dying. A lot of the trees have been planted uh, there you know, some time ago. But you can see that uh, about five down the periods of drought, the, the main problem was we were just not getting the water we had before, and we were getting hotter temperatures. We have incredibly uh, ferocious fires in, in Australia. And you always hear about the people who die in the bushfires. What you don't hear about is twice the number that actually die from the heat of our cities. So we've started to put in place an urban forest strategy and an open space strategy. And basically, the idea is we need to cool our city. How do we keep our city at the same temperature it is 10 years ago uh, in 15, 20 years' time when the temperature is going up? We know that if we plant trees, we can actually lower the temperature of the city by 4 degrees. So we decided to put uh, an urban forest strategy in it, pretty much like the postcode 3000. We didn't talk about trees, because if you talk about trees in Melbourne, you get an emotional argument between exotics and uh, the indigenous species. And that argument goes round in circles, and everybody's got their own view on it. So the instruction to my, my team was, I don't want to hear about trees, I want to hear about percentages. Tell me what the canopy cover has to go to to keep the temperature as it is today in 30 years' time. And the figure they came back with was 22% 20, needs to go to 40%. We need a diversity of species because some of our trees, the plane trees, that the London plains, were not coping with the hot weather very well. So we, we need a diversity. We need to improve the health of our vegetation. We've paved the city so well that we're not getting water into the, the, in, the, in the ground. So we had a strategy that adopted these targets and these goals, and everybody agreed with those, and it was adopted. We then put in place uh, an app, and if you want to Google uh, City of Melbourne and look up urban forest strategy, up comes this map. If you were walking around our city, you could touch on any one of those triangles or squares as you walk past it, and it would tell you the name of the tree, how old it is, what its life expectancy is. We gave everyone an email address so we, uh, we could actually store uh, their data. People started writing to the email address. People started writing to the trees. This was the best thing that ever happened to me. I remember the CEO at the time saying, you're not going to reply, are you? His fear was, you know, headline, council staff spend time writing to trees. It went viral. It went around the world. We had trees in America writing to our trees, saying, you know, how tough it was. <laughs> so once we had this going and people suddenly realized that we had a problem, then the conversation about what sort of tree you're going to have became quite easy. We could go into the community, and we could go back to those town hall meetings and talk to people about, so what trees do you want? And what streets do you want to uh, put your trees into? So this actually worked. Ooh, they're giving me five minutes. I'm in trouble.
trouble. <laughs> the next one is integrated action. Um, you know, very low water in, in uh, levels. You can see what's happening to our rainfall in Melbourne. So we started to work with different agencies. Sorry, I'm looking at this and, and the slides coming in one after. You can see what's happening with our water. Um, we started to work with different agencies and say, how do we turn the city into a catchment? How do we capture everything that falls on the city and use that water? You know, simple things like allowing the water to run off the street into the trees, building tanks, storing the water, using it in our parks and gardens. This is one of our heritage gardens. When I said to uh, the heritage people, we're going to dig up the, the park, they got tired and emotional. But, you know, <laughs> what you said was, yes, it's going to be a big tank, it's five million litres. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a depot that you can see there that had been added on to incrementally over time, and we're going to chop it in half, and we're going to rationalize... Uh, sorry. How did I do that? Oh, sorry. Two slides up. Confusing myself. We're going to chop it in half. We're going to rationalize the depot. We'll be, we're able to function the depot. Over the tank, we'll reinstate the uh, parkland, so you can see the big green circle there and we'll use the water back in the park. So five million liters goes back, and we use about 80% of the water we need uh, for the park it goes back in. And we also built a visitor center. We've dug up our roads and we put tanks under the roads and we purified the water in the center of the road. We've created normal wetlands. We are now collecting 20% of the water that we need for the uh, parks and gardens of our central city. Adaptability, and, and for me, this is the most important one, because this talks about what we need to do going into the future. I've told you the story of Postcode 3000 and, and the reuse of buildings. That building with the glass panel in it was an old building converted. We've got a lot of sustainable strategies, which I haven't got time to talk to you about, but they're important. And, and we continue to do that, and we're building our own uh, solar uh, um, power station out in the desert with 10 other partners so that we get green energy for the city. But the adaptability I'm talking about is things like stealing back the street. So we got fantastic streets, and what we did is we just started to steal them back. We started to steal them back in small pieces, so Vic Roads, the state agency, would never notice. We just widened the footpaths and we put medians down the middle. We took the cars from once off one side of the street and gave it back to the footpaths on the other. We dug up concrete and planted trees. We dug up center of roads and planted median trees. We put down green ash, uh, uh, permeable asphalt that actually allowed water to go through to this uh, subsoil uh, that we had prepared, and then we planted trees where the cars were parked so that they'd actually get watered. We took traffic islands uh, that were 529 square meters and plenty of road around them and turned them into 5,000 square meter parks, simply by just reducing the amount of traffic, and there was very little traffic in that area anyway. And this park sits right next to a primary school, which is at the bottom of the slide. So we've gone through slowly and started to just take more and more out of the city. We closed uh, the bottom of South Bank Boulevard uh, for the Commonwealth Games in 2006, and everybody said, that's a great idea, we'll have a square. The hidden agenda was that it actually dropped the cars that used that street from 30,000 to 13,000. We're about to, in April, take half of that street uh, and create uh, 2.7 hectares of linear park that runs from uh, the park uh, from one of our major parks down to the river, and that's a before and after of some of the work that we're doing there. We've closed other streets, as you can see here, and we've actually built facilities for uh, you know people, futsal courts, basketball courts. We've taken 80 hectares of asphalt out of the centre city and converted it back to park and, and widened footpaths. Why is that important? Because when we did the open space strategy, we would have had to find 700 million dollars to buy the open space we needed. We were never going to do that. So this conversion of asphalt was important. I was asked to talk a little bit about the market, uh, and this is an adaptation project we're going through at the moment, where the spaces in Melbourne were the markets, and we had four fantastic markets. The Western market, that's gone. The fish market, that went for an over, uh, flyover over King Street. Eastern market, that's gone. We have one left, the Queen Victoria market. It's seven hectares of market and it's slowly dying. And it's a project we've got in the office at the moment. How do you refurbish uh, a, a large market like this and bring it back into a fully operable market? It hasn't changed much uh, in the time. That's as it used to look 
uh, you know, some time ago, 1907, <coughs> that's how it looks today. And a lot of the Ock Health and Safety and other issues, forklifts hitting with pedestrians, um, means that you can't carry on operating. Plus, with climate change, there's half a possibility that a very big wind would actually lift some of those sheds and just move them somewhere else. So we're having to deal with this, and we've got 750 traders who all have different views about what we do. The city's moving up to the north. You can see Queen Victoria Market in the green, and the yellow are some of the buildings being built. This is what's been built already around that. So this is a really important public space for the city. And what we've decided we need to do is get it back to being what it used to be, more of a food market <coughs> rather than the trash and treasure that it has become. We need to get back to the authentic market trading where you get the exchange. This sort of uh, our deli and meat hall are thriving. And one of our strategies was to do what we've been doing elsewhere, and that was to convert car park into a development site. So we own the blue piece of land there, the state government owned the green, the green is all car parking and road. And what we did is we drew, redrew the diagram and said, well, why don't we just move a road that goes through, the blue can become an open space, we'll put the car parking underground, and the red can become a development site, we'll actually bring the city up to the market, and we'll reinvest that money in the market. And, and the reinvestment is somewhere between 70 to $90 million. So the strategy is we're gonna build a basement, so we can actually put storage and um, uh, cool rooms, etc., for the market. We're going to take away the open space uh, at, at where the cars are parked and create open space. It won't actually look like that. We'll redirect the road uh, through um, the, the site. These slides I downloaded the other night very quickly, and, and they're slightly corrupted in that, so I apologize for that. But that road runs through the market, and then we'll edge the, the, the bottom edge of the market um, you know, with uh, the, the building development. What we're trying to do is allow the city to come back up to the market and encompass the market and embrace it. The moment you arrive there, go round and round about, hit a car park, and, uh, you know, eventually you get to the market. So this is the street going in, goes down to our docklands, and this is the commercial development, and this is just a mock-up of it uh, sitting in the back of the site. So we're hoping within a few years, and we're just about to start construction on the site, that uh, we will achieve this. We've had five years of approvals, which is the nature of the game we're in. It takes a long time. We've used art to start a stimulating an understanding of what the trading is uh, about there. And we've designed with uh, Breathe Architects, who are one of the architectural firms in uh, Melbourne, this temporary pavilion that's 120 meters long. It will drop between the Delhi and Meat Hall and, and the sheds and be the temporary location for those traders who are relocated while we fix up the shed. It's a, a greenhouse from Holland. So while we've got the trading underneath, we're going to have this 120 meters uh, building above, glazed, a light at night, which is part of the problem in the market, it's closed at night, and generate, we hope, something that will bring back some life to the market. This whole exercise that we've done in the city has meant that with more people, we're paying uh, less tax. We're taking as much money, but you can divide it for more people. The stats on this uh, city are quite interesting. Uh, the population that visit the city has gone up. Uh, our population, resident population has gone up. Economic growth has gone up. Business growth has gone up. We've actually, they did a survey, and I think it, uh, it would take you something like four years if you took, picked a different cafe uh, to have lunch in each day. The only thing that's going down is the motor vehicles. I'm going to go very quickly now on what is most the most important. All of that stuff you've heard about is in the central city. Our challenge is not the central city. Our challenge is the metropolitan area. If you look at every Australian city at the moment, this is the diagram you get. If it's orange and red, those people are suffering. They're spending a lot of time getting to work. They're owning two cars. They're disconnected from their infrastructure. And every city in Melbourne, major capital city, has that same pattern. What do the politicians do when they say they need affordable housing? They just eat up some more farmland on the fringe. So we get this conflict, and we've actually converted 89 million hectares of really good arable land into concrete and roads and asphalt. And this is what we're building. And we all know that doesn't solve the problem. You've never seen a city build its way out of congestion. 
We're getting bankruptcy on, uh, and most of those on those fringe uh, areas because people are being convinced to build a, uh, buy a house there. And it's a cheap house and package. But once you start putting the car and the commute, eight thousand dollars a year just to use the free, uh, freeway toll for a family. We're getting, uh, you know, a surge in abuse, family abuse on the fringe. Why? Frustration, isolation. We're not getting walkability. We're getting obesity because people are actually sitting in cars and stressing instead of walking to use uh, public transport. 130 billion a year in obesity in Australia. Imagine if we can start to actually cut back on that. But the debate you hear is all about minerals and engineering. Yet 8% of our GDP comes out of residential. and We get very little debate about that. The solution that I think would work is something that happened uh, to me when I went to university in the mid-60s. Cape Town University, with all the ba baby boomers coming to it, couldn't accommodate uh, its population, and they could not expand. So they asked a different question. How well are we using the stuff we've got? And what turned out is that they were using lecture theatres 17.5% of the day. There they were, stuck on Table Mountain. I went back 40 years later and had hardly built a single thing. They had trebled the population, and the only thing that was noticeable was how exciting the campus was, how vibrant it was. So the question to myself was, why can't you do that to a city? Why can't you just re-timetable it? Why do you have to go and build more stuff? Now, of course we have to build more stuff. But the, the key, in a way, is the way we look at our city. So we look at two construction workers and, and a gent sleeping on a train, and I'm not sure what that conjures up in your mind, but the two construction workers are actually training in the site sheds on the construction site. And the attendance is better and the results are better. The guy on the train is actually going to work before 7 o'clock. He's getting a free trip, which is saving the government 85 million because they would have had to buy five trains to carry him after 7 o'clock. So what I'm talking about here are called the 7.5% city. And here I'm using the figure 8 million because when we did the study, that's where we thought we were going. So where would we put 8 million people um, in the city? We'd put them around the railway stations. We can get 860,000 people around the railway stations and never build over eight storeys. We've got a lot of those, and it's happening. Our railway stations are starting to be built up, as you can see in South Yarra. We could put them along the transport corridors, the bus and tram corridors, and we've got a lot of those. The orange are the bus, the yellow are the tram corridors. A great infrastructure, really poorly coordinated. Buses just seem to arrive just after the train, or the tram's gone, or the train's gone. You know, there's seven bus companies running it um, who don't talk to each other. So we took every site in Melbourne along those corridors and said only the, those fronting them, if we take out all the sensitivities, heritage, all the rest of it, how many people can you put there? 2.4 million. So this is the stuff. You've got the infrastructure down the middle of the road, that's the stuff beside it. What if you actually built to five to eight storeys, as, as other cities do? And that's starting to happen. This is uh, one of the streets, Brunswick Street. You can see the infill that's happening there. This little building's 240 people per hectare. You go down the street, you don't even notice it's there. So it's not about destroying the character of the area. This is some of the other infill that's gone in. This site used to be a car park. It's now uh, social housing. It's got childcare. Um, you know, community facilities and uh, a supermarket. It's also got the parking that used to be there. So being smart, cities that do smart things, is actually what we're interested in. And, and it's a different description maybe to where smart cities are going at the moment. And in our greenfield sites, we can put another 500,000, and, and that's an underestimate as a change. So what do you, how do you do this? You take that area, and you throw out your planning scheme, and you say, where do you want to build? And you mark that and you write the rules around that. And it simply says you can build to a certain height and right behind that you can't and your planning scheme looks a bit like this. You can do it on one page. Basically keep the heritage, get the proportions right, cut off angle to the back, bring the cars in from the back, etc. And, and some of the things about active frontages. We all know those simple rules. So suddenly you're going to get streets that uh, are like this, turning to streets that are like this, and you're going to get other areas close to railway stations, it might look a bit like this. What does it look like? It looks a bit like this. Along those corridors, you start to get the linear development, the high street. You don't touch the stuff in between, so 
93% or 92.5% of the environment's not touched. That's a very easy political sell in a city like ours. And you turn that into your new green wedges. You turn that into the area where you put your solar voltaics, you collect your water, and people can walk to, out of that to these areas where there are opportunities. What's the value of that? Well, at $8 million, it's $440 billion you would save in infrastructure over the next 50 years. Imagine what we could do with $440 billion. So I'll leave you with that thought. We've got to rethink the way we actually design our cities. And we've got to rethink the way we think about our cities. The Victorian government at the moment is agonizing over the 20 schools they've got to build in the next five or six years. In New Zealand, when they had the earthquake in Christchurch and some of their schools fell down, what did they do? They hot-seated their schools. School in the morning, school in the afternoon. Teenagers would love that. We've just got to think carefully about it. Trams in Melbourne, if trams go on a shift, they stop for 13% of their time at, at, at a traffic light. Yesterday, and if we could drop that to 10%, it's equivalent to 30 trams, new trams. Yesterday in Berlin, I saw the solution. They actually make the cars pull aside, put the tram the other side, so the tram goes through. It's such an easy solution just to give the tram the priority. We've got to reprioritize our cities. Thank you.